wall. Oh, we're live. That's on. Okay. We're live. And I just realized that Gabe's shirt matches my wall. So I and should actually, be at, I should actually be at your my place. shirt kind of matches your wall. So come on over. Let's switch. Come Chinese fire over. drill. Oh, no. Have you ever done that? A Chinese fire drill? Yeah. I thought you were going to say, have you ever sung with, not sung with me? I, ha it, I don't think it's politically correct. Politically correct. So I apologize for that. Anyway, moving, okay. moving on. Moving on. Today. God. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Let's be real, people. Welcome yeah. to Live on the Mighty. My name is Anne Marie. I'm with my pal Gabe. We are going to have a really great conversation today. One thing that Gabe and I want to talk about is. Oh, I don't even know what you call it. If there's like a syndrome for it or whatever it is, but why do we keep making comments about people talking about their mental health when we need to be talking about our mental health? Because if we don't talk about it now, then it's too late. So we need to seriously understand what's going on here. You hear me? You feel me on this gig? You feel me? I, I both hear you and feel you um, in a COVID, you know, social distancing kind of way. Um, so, right. You know, there's this thing that we're trying to do. I, so I'm the editor in chief of this mental health recovery website. It's called OC87 Recovery Diaries. And our mission is to bust stigma. So how do you do that? Right. You talk about things. Um, you talk about things that are uncomfortable or you talk about things that are painful or you talk about things that are um, hurtful and uh Mental health challenges can be all of those things. Um, they can be a lot more than that too. But for so many years and for so many decades, we've shelved these things, we've shoved them down, we've repressed them, we've suppressed them, we've taken people who have mental health challenges and we've locked them away in these draconian brick mm -hmm. buildings and forgotten about them. Uh, parents have been told, lock your child away and forget about them. Just forget about them, that's it. Um, and yet we, you know, we're turning the corner and we're saying, no, you know, we're, we're not going to do that anymore. And we're not going to not talk about these things. And so people are coming out and sharing. And then what happens sometimes there's this culture of shaming or yes. judgment that goes along with that. Um, oh, you're, you're, you know, full of shit. You're malingering. You're faking. Oh, you'd never do that. You're attention seeking. You're whatever. Right. And, yeah. you know, what is the message the is the message is shut up. Yeah. And also, I always think about it's not just saying it to the person who might be reaching out. It's you're sitting in a group of people and you say, oh, my God, did you hear Gabe the other day? He was talking about how, he, you know, he's having suicidal thoughts. And then the people that are sitting around you when you're making fun of that person, how do they feel comfortable to reach out? How right. can they possibly reach out? If they if they hear you making fun of other people who are talking about it, I just don't understand that. I can't wrap my head around it. Well, so we talk about like who are safe people, right? Who are safe people to reach out to and to go to if you're feeling suicidal, if you're if you're having those thoughts. Um, a safe person is not someone who would denigrate someone else who is coming forward to talk about their mental health. Right. You know, you want, you want to be the kind of person who is open to hearing anything, not who's responding to things in, in a judgmental or a nasty way. You're absolutely right. Because then how can you, how can anybody want to reach out to you if you're going to, if you're judgy about things like that? I don't, I mean, you know, we talk about when someone dies by suicide, the first thing everybody says is, Oh my God, that was so, that's so terrible. It's that's tragic that that happened, but that's, that's because they didn't feel like they could talk to anybody. None of us really want to die. That's not the conversation that we're trying to have. We're trying to have a, hey, look, we are feeling completely overwhelmed and we feel like we're, you know, in over our heads here. We need help. And how, so it, it goes like, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. So people who do say, well, she's an attention seeker and she's faking and that, that she wouldn't really do that. What do you want people to do who are feeling that way? What, 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 what do you right. expect them right. to do? Right. Do you want them to reach out? Because to me, I want my kid to reach out because the alternative, I don't want that at all. Right, right. You know? I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to knock your socks off by I'm telling you. I'm not wearing what, any. Well, are you sure? Really? You're not? Come on. Wow. That's cute. <laughs> I'm wearing ones with little Volkswagens on them, obviously. Oh, um, obviously. So 
I'm going to tell you the place where I heard the phrase attention seeker full of shit the most. It's a psychiatric hospital mm. where I where I used to work. So we would have people come in to uh, the crisis center um, or, you know, present at the crisis lobby. And I'm not going to name the hospital, <laughs> um, but, you know, people you recognize the names and, and staff members who've been there for a long time would roll their eyes. Oh, this fucking guy, they're fearful of shit attention seeker, malinger, borderline, right? You heard it all the time, mm -hmm. all the time, okay? From mental health professionals, from people who are charged with taking care of the, the sickest people in the county. Um, so if that's the language that we're using on the unit, and I'm, I'm gonna, I used it too. So I, and I'm, I'm not exonerating myself or exempting myself. You, you get, institutionalized right at these right. places not just patients but staff and you you kind of take on the persona and the lingo and the judgment of everyone else there um but you have to look at it this way if someone is coming to a locked inpatient psychiatric hospital at two or three o'clock in the morning and they're saying i'm suicidal and i want to be in the hospital whether or not they are actively suicidal or they're saying that for to get in there for whatever some other reason there's a serious problem there uh, with that part there so that needs to be addressed right and that that person even if they are doing that for some other kind of secondary gain they need to be taken seriously and they need to be treated with empathy and compassion because they have nowhere else to go right. and that's and that horrible. is your last resort as someone who has been hospitalized i'm going to tell you i didn't really want to go there but i had no choice because my alternative was to not be here yeah. so i don't you don't nobody wants to be hospitalized that's not something we want to do i just saw a robin williams quote the other day and i think it rain, it it just rings true to this is that the right metaphor yes sure okay it said um nobody fakes depression they fake being okay and that is so true. You know, do you think somebody wants to fake being depressed? This is not fun. I hate to tell you. It's not a, you know, it's not a dance party with singing and tiaras and stilettos. It just isn't. However, I do fake being okay much, much easier than I could fake being depressed. So and here's I my question though. Why, why? Well, I mean, I don't do it anymore, but you know, you know, because I got people now that I can reach out to. But back before, you can't be depressed. How could you be depressed? You have four kids. You have a house. You you have a job. Well, how could you possibly be depressed? Everything's going great in your life. What could possibly be wrong? Nothing's wrong. People say that. I mean, up, just just up, because yeah. the surface shows you one thing doesn't mean you understand what's going on in someone's brain. And, you know, even if they do have what seems to be a perfect life, you don't know what past trauma they've been through or things that they've gone through themselves. You have no idea what brings that on. So to, to you know, brush it to the side and not validate what they're going through is exactly what's perpetuating the feeling of not wanting to talk about it. And Lauren just commented here talking about feeling invalidated um, from her trauma. And she said, you know, she had to, to go to dinner and um, but she really wanted to be a part of this. So that's that's the biggest crime, I think, that we commit against people when we deny them their own truth. Yep. We invalidate their experience. Who the fuck are you to tell someone that they're not depressed or you suicidal? Know, or, or I hope all of our friends are watching this because everyone says I swear more than you. You freaking swear more than I do. Oh, uh, yeah. I think we're allowed. Did, did, were we allowed? Yes, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't you, ask I now. Just want, I just yeah. want to point it out that you swear more than I do. I do. I do. And we were at a conference once and Anne-Marie and I were, were letting it rip and Anne-Marie got in trouble and I didn't. <laughs> I think that's really messed up. <laughs> that was um, messed up. It was sad. Anyways, but anyway. We need to validate. Validation is key to survival. It really is. And, uh, you know, I'll... It's it's so hard, and and Kathy just said it's it's too hard to reach out, and that's it all depends on who's the re on the receiving end of that, right? Yeah. So you like for instance, when you call one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five, so that's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That 
will send your call to one of, I think it's by now it's like 176 crisis centers all across the country. So the phone will ring at the psychiatric hospital where I used to work. If you call in certain area codes and there are members in the crisis department, people who I know and and love and care about and some who I don't, um, who work there and will answer those phones. Some of them are better than others. Um, Some of them may have had a messed up day and they'll pick up that phone and they will not be in the best form, right? You're supposed to leave all your stuff at the door when you go to work, but that's not really People possible. People are human, we're, they're human. We're human, we're human beings, right? Um, and that's not an excuse, but that is a reality. Um, but what I will say is that sometimes it's it's luck of the draw. You may get a super empathic, skilled, right. wonderful, lovely um, crisis worker, or you may get someone who's really not that great um, or may not be great in that moment. Um, but I, I can tell you when I was like 10, I reached out to my mom. Okay. I was a super, super anxious kid. I was a really messed up kid. Um, and I reached out to her for help. I said, I really need to talk to someone. Um, and th- I hate that this happened, but this is what happened. She kind of rolled her eyes a little bit and said, oh, Gabriel, you know, you're just, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. And well, uh, go ahead. It's generational too. I mean, I hate oh, yes. to say it because I'm not. I'm not trying to. That, that's terrible that that happened. But for for the record, she didn't let's, really know what to let's say. Let's get her on the phone. Let's call my mom. No, just kidding. Not, um, she didn't that. know what to say, and this this goes yeah. back to. I, I, I do want to talk about this. I don't want to forget to comment about what Ryan said. But this is about education, right? It's not just yeah. kids that need education. It's parents. Parenting does everyone, not come with everyone. a rule book. There's no manual to tell me how to handle this. I have kids with stuff going on. I have my own stuff going on. How do I manage all of that? We don't know. So it is conversations like this that are really, really important because it can open a door for a parent who might have said something very similar because, Gabe, let's be honest. Like when your kid comes and says that to you, it's freaking scary as hell. Oh my God. It is so scary to think that your child is thinking that. I would want to run for the hills, (laughs) you know? You better run. You better hide. Okay, I'm gonna be back while you finish that. Okay, but so listen, I want to. I want. We need to talk about what Ryan just said. He said he's been told that he's lazy, and that he is looking for attention. Uh, FYI, everybody, people who are living with depression aren't. Oh, it was. It was Kira. I'm sorry, Kira. I don't have glasses glasses on. My God, (laughs) Emery. I was like, yes. who's Ryan? What's she talking about? If I, just I don't have my glasses on. They got a glare. Okay, wait, let's go back to this conversation. Really important. Well, I'm really sorry about that. Anyways, they're not lazy. Do you know how, how much work it takes for someone living with depression to freaking get up and maintain the day? Like, and I don't mean like get up yeah. and go to work. I mean, get up and even go to the bathroom. To do anything. To do anything. When you are depressed, you are the complete opposite of lazy. You're strong as hell because you are getting through those days because you have strength that you didn't even know was there. That is not lazy. That's, I call bullshit on that big time, yeah. bullshit. And second of all, attention seeking. Um, yeah, guess what? We do need attention That's and right. every, we're human beings. All human beings want attention. You, if you, if there's somebody out there that says they don't want attention, they're full of crap. I well, love we need, we, attention. And we need to change the language from attention seeking to help seek. They're, Thank they're seeking you. help. Yes, they're, they're seeking just seeking help. help. And attention seeking isn't bad. Do some people use negative ways to get attention? A hundred percent. Nobody's freaking perfect. But if you're reaching out and you're trying to explain your thoughts, even if it's it, it's a negative way, there's something going on that you need help with. So stop calling people who are depressed lazy and stop calling people who have anxiety like they have like a social disorder because they can't be around other people and stop saying we're attention seeking because i'm pretty sure you want us to seek attention now not after we're in a hospital hospital because we tried to you know do something to ourselves and do we call people who call the police after they've been shot oh you're just seeking attention you know put a band-aid on it you're fine click you know come on that's that we the, the hospital that I worked at specialized in mental health emergencies. So suicidality is a mental health emergency. Um, unmedicated psychosis that's Wait, resulting- I just said I was right. Someone said I was right. You know I love when people say I'm right. It's like they, she's I right, think they were, she's right. No, that was a typo. They meant to write he. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, but that's, that's it's an emergency. Yes, and it's an when emergency. You're, when you're experiencing an emergency, I'm just using the prop phone because it's here. You You call for help. You know, mine's cooler. Um, 
but that's what it's all about. And we really, really need to not only normalize help-seeking behavior, but uh, encourage it and not discourage it. I think we also need to teach people how to reach out for help and how people should give help because people don't know. You know, someone comes to you and says, I'm feeling really suicidal. I, I can't stop thinking about dying. People freeze up. They don't know how to handle that. So we need yeah. to teach people questions, comments, they could ask that person and somebody said it's really hard to reach out I totally agree with you it's totally hard and there's ways that you can do it you have to find your safe network I agree with you Gabe on that and it could be as easy as sending an emoji Gabe you and I have talked about this before just a random emoji because it's really easy to send an emoji that you and that person know hey if I send this emoji I need freaking help now yeah. um, that's easy to do it's hard to text I need help and you know, I'm going to bring it back to what would you miss? Because, you know. <laughs> Hit it. Telling them something you would miss if you weren't here, that's a red flag to them. And they could maybe let you know that they would miss you if you weren't here. And it can, it can open up a conversation that's really hard. It's really easy to text someone, hey, you know, I'd miss singing in, singing in the car with you, you know, at the top of our lungs, even though you don't want to. That may send a message to them that you need help that you didn't, that they didn't realize that you needed at that time. So. Yeah. And, um, and, and really, wait, one more thing. Let me just no, say, no, go ahead, thing. go ahead. Sorry. And for parents, like it's hard to talk to your kid. I get it. I mean, I, I had a whole conversation with my kids the other day about herpes. So I'm not that parent. I could talk to my kids about anything. If you tell your kid, you know, that things that you miss about them, I know as a kid, you feel like you're a burden to your parents. You feel like, oh my God, they got to drive me everywhere. I never clean up. They're always yelling at me. My grades are crap. Your kid is feeling so much strong anxiety that they, they do, you think that they'd be, be they'd be better off if they weren't here and you'd be better off, you know, letting them know that you'd miss all those things that are so annoying. Cause I'm going to tell you something. I've spoken to enough parents whose child have died by suicide and they would much rather hear that front door slam again um, than not see their kid ever again. So reaching out and just telling people, even those little annoying things that they do validates their existence and lets them know that they matter. Even those annoying little things, even Gabe picking his nose, like I would miss that. Yeah. So I don't, don't do that in front of you at least. So I don't know. Just where your nose in the car with from. me hundred percent. Oh my God. Anyway, yeah. And I've wiped it on your seat too. Um, it's true. But anyway, getting back to reality here, um, I think, so when we talk about reaching out, um, I think we also need to be teaching people how to reach in. Um, so there's there's so much of that that kind of language of, oh, if you're not doing well, reach out and call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and call this and call that and and send an emoji to this. And, and that's, all, that's all true and that's all valid and that's all right. But also teaching people to be aware um, of warning signs, danger signs of risk factors for suicide, for worsening depression, um, letting people know, you know, hey, if you see something kind of hinky that someone says on social media, you pick up the phone and yeah. you check in on them. Don't wait for them to reach out to you because at a certain point, you know, we talk all the time about how suicide is preventable and it is but it's a continuum, right? Right. So suicide is preventable here, 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 here. And it, it is oftentimes in adults, it is not an impulsive act. Um, in youth, it, it very often is, but it's in adults, reaction. There's, there's often a time window to intervene. However, if there is not earlier intervention, once it gets to the point where like, that's it, and and the kind of the train is on the tracks and it's leaving the station, um, that person is not going to reach out because that decision has been made. Um, and it's going to be up to you to reach out and, and prevent that earlier. Um, so we talk about the lifeline all the time. We talk about the crisis text line. I want people to be intervening way earlier. Um, you know, when you're having trouble at work, when you've gotten a warning from your supervisor, when your wife says, you know, I, this is really messed up, I, I'm thinking about leaving you, um, when maybe prescription drug abuse is, is kind of just starting, be watchful, be mindful of these things with people. Mm -hmm. Just randomly check in on people. Hey, how are you doing? How's work going? 
Yeah. How's, how's your relationship It is about going? checking in though, because people who are at that end stage aren't usually reaching out. So it, I, I want to say something. I'm not sure if I talked about it here before or if it, I just did it in one of my videos. Depression is an illness, much like cancer, much like lupus. It's an illness. And when you are at that point where you are planning your suicide, you are end stage. That's end yeah. stage. It's just like being stage four cancer. I'm sure I'm going to get crap for saying it like that, but it, I want people to understand that it's an illness. And until you get to that stage planning, there is intervention in there. There is a way to prevent it. But you, you're right, Gabe. Once somebody gets to pass that end stage, there's there's nothing you can do. So we have to get it into that beginning. And we have to say to people, the truth is, is I've been there. Like I've been there more times than I want to admit. I never wanted to die at that those times. I wanted the pain to end. Yeah. And you have no way of learning how to make that pain end unless you give yourself the tools. And the way our society is right now with everything going on, we are inundated with depression and anxiety. And I'm scared of the outcome of that. And yeah, very, one, very much so. One more thing somebody posted in there about being pregnant. Um, you know, when you when you have kids and you're pregnant and you're going through depression and having suicidal thoughts, it's really hard to talk about it because everyone's like how could you feel that way you're pregnant and you're growing a life and that just makes you feel more guilty because you're like how that why the fuck do i feel this way if i have this baby growing inside of me those are normal thoughts to have because it's scary your hormones are out of whack yeah. i totally understand that as someone who suffered from postpartum depression as gabe knows i've written about this please seek get help talk to somebody you those hormones while you're growing that baby and even afterwards are going to be all out of whack and it's going to affect your emotions. Um, it, you're not alone. Postpartum depression after that baby is born is real and it, it can really affect you and you, you know, your lifestyle. You are not alone though. You are not the only person feeling that I totally yeah. can relate to that a hundred percent. And it also applies to fathers. I want that to be yeah. made clear too, that life well, changes. I'm not a dad, so. No, I, well, that's why I'm, that's why I'm putting that out there that life that changes. That's, that's right. I'm the penis perspective. It's called PP. <gasps> um, but anyway, so that's, that's a reality too. And life changes for, for both um, after the birth of a child. And I think there, men really don't understand that that's possible um, to experience, you know, severe depression, like after the birth of a child. Um, so I just think it's really important for that to be, to be made clear. Sorry, I had to get I had to get really close so I could read some of those comments. Yeah, and Ray's like, what? Is, what? Does that say? <laughs> I can't put my glasses on because I can't see anything. So one more thing I do want to say, and I know we're getting close with time. I know that reaching out seems really hard, and it is hard. But once you do it the first time, the next time's a little easier, and the time yeah. after that's a little easier. It does get easier to reach out. Honest to God. I'm not, you know, blowing smoke up anyone's butt. Um, it really is about finding the people that you can connect with. And there are people out there. And the crisis line is helpful. And if you don't connect with someone, like Gabe said, you do it again. You, you hang up, hang try up and else. try again. I mean, yeah. that's why those numbers are there. And um, I just think it, it, it seems so hard to reach out at first. And I know it was really hard for me in the past, but now I get it. Like I, I do reach out not as well as I should all the time. Um, I wish I did a little bit more because it, it can be hard. I get it. But once you do it the first time, the second time, it's a little easier. And, and it gets, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, Don't be sorry. The only, well, I am. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say Jewish, though. is, well, I am. God, it, it, we're just letting everyone know about everything. I pick my nose. I'm, <laughs> Yeah, Jewish uh, penis perspective. Okay, um, if reaching out, Reach if reaching out, out to, to a, can someone mute her? Um, <laughs> if reaching out directly to the lifeline or to the crisis text line directly for the first time seems insurmountable to you, it doesn't have. You don't have to do that right away, unless right. you are literally, literally in crisis. Use a close friend, use a loved one, use someone you trust as a gateway to that. Reach out to that person who you love and care about and who you know loves and cares about you first and just say, I'm scared. I'm yeah. really scared right now. 
and I need you to be with me. Can we call this number together? Can we, I love can that. we do this together? Can we make, can we do, um, you know, a three-way call together? Will you stay with me, uh, while I do this? And I guarantee you they will. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's so important to be able to have support while you're doing this really hard thing. Um, because nobody wants to be alone um, while they're feeling like this. And, you know, now with COVID and the pandemic, it's been over a year and we've spent so Wait, much time what's, alone. What's COVID? I don't know. Um, but you don't, you don't have to be alone to take this step. You don't. And one thing I do want to say, so Gabe is speaking right now to everybody who needs to reach out to help. I'm going to talk to you, those people getting that response from someone that says I'm scared. Please take them in and show them compassion and love and empathy because they it took a lot for that person to reach out. And it may seem drastic to you what they're saying and maybe you've never gone through it, you've never experienced that, but for that person to message you that was really hard. Open the door and let them in. Yep. Don't give them crap about it. Let them say what they have to say because for me that's when I say what's on my mind that way, I'm releasing it. It gets the it it takes the power out of my head, right? Because it, it's controlling me. So when I let it out, I'm releasing that power. So I need someone that I can say those dark, really heavy things to. And those people who have never experienced that, more people have. Like, this is not something that's unique to one person. There was a time, and Gabe, you know this, you and I have discussed this, where I woke up every single day and I thought, if I died today, it's all right. I literally woke up and thought that every single day of my life for a very, very long time. Yep. I held that in. I held that in until I got to the breaking point because I felt like if I said that to someone, they would judge me and it wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't welcome what I had to say. And I know it's hard to hear, but I keep seeing this stupid meme that goes around and everyone knows how Gabe and I feel about, you know, those quotes, but it's true. I think you'd rather listen to them talk about their feelings right now than listen to their eulogy. And, and I'll tell you something else, Anne Marie. What if you, if you had told me that? I mean, I know we've talked about it kind of after the fact, but if you had told me that in the moment, you know, I, I wake up every day feeling like, what's you know, what's the point? I would have said, me too. And, and that that I just got goosebumps. Saying something like that to somebody is so incredibly powerful. It validates what you're going through what they're going through and shows that you're not alone. And that's one of the lies that mental illness whispers to you, right? You're the, you're, mm -hmm. it's only you, it's only you. You're the only one that's fucked up. You're the only one of you. And it's Twice. the biggest bullshit out there. Oh, I've been keeping tabs on YouTube, but. <laughs> um, so I know we've come to an end. So I'm going to tell you, Gabe, what I would miss about you. Okay. I would miss your stupid phone. That's right there. Cause I got the same one at my house, my black phone. I would miss you dropping the F-bomb more than me. I would miss you knowing every musical that is out there. And even though you don't sing like Cardi B, Just Bieber with me, I know for a fact you've sang Rubber Ducky with me. And I would miss getting you to go outside your shell like that and singing ridiculous songs with me. I would miss that so incredibly. Can I reciprocate? I didn't know of we were course. doing this today, but I'm 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 cool with this. Um, I would miss your honesty. I would miss your integrity. Uh, I would miss your generosity of heart. I would miss those little granola bars that you had in your house <laughs> that I stole when I was there doing my road trip, um, and it was so good. And I I was eating it in the middle of your street, preparing to leave, and we cut this out of the film. But I was eating. I said. This is actually really fucking good. Um, so that part's not in the movie, but I, I did say that. Um, and and I would miss your ability to get me to do anything. <laughs> I really, do have that power. We really, really do, I? and it's really it's a little disturbing. Um, I can but get I you do, to dance in an it. elevator. Yeah, right in my chair. Anyways, thanks you everyone for listening to Gabe and I yammer on and to Gabe to swear, which is always refreshing. Uh, uh, and please, Anne Marie. I didn't swear. say the, I, whatever. You, yeah, if you, you did. If, if you are in crisis, please text 741741 or call 
1-800-273-8255. Thank you. And I hope you tune into us next month where God only knows what we're going to talk about. But hey, if anyone's got any ideas, just send us a message. We'll talk about it. We'll yeah. talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about No? Damn it. Damn it. Sex and mental health could be a really maybe, good Maybe next. Maybe next time. Okay. Tune in next we'll time. Bye-bye.